My name is Strange Loop. When I was born, my mommy said I was her special little boy and that I could beat any game I wanted. Growing up that seemed to be true as I successfully beat Teletubbies for the PS1, Spider-Man for the PS1, Metal Slug X for the PS1 and many other games for the PS1. But then the next generation of games turned out to be too much for my little diseased riddled third world brain. First came Garfield for the PS2, but the killing blow was delivered by the horrible evil no good game by the name of Shadow of Memories in Europe and Japan or Shadow of Destiny in North America. My beautiful bulbous baby brain simply couldn't keep up. The game used many big words and at the time me English many bad B. I wasn't even able to get past the prologue part and shortly after I gave up completely on the game. Because of that my mummy was severely disappointed in me and she never believed in my gaming prowess ever again. But I am a different person now, I am a grown man. I once got through the entire Shrek movie in Beat Saber on twitch.tv slash strange underscore loop. I even streamed for over 300 hours once on twitch.tv slash strange underscore loop. I will not let Shadow of Memories haunt my memories ever again. First let me just explain what kind of a game Shadow of Memories actually is. So it was released in 2001 for the PS2, Xbox and PC and then later in 2009 it came out on the PSP with like a bunch of different fixes and changes to the game. Shadow of Memories is pretty much like a point and click adventure game about a guy using time travel to prevent his own death. So the worst type of game an 8 year old creation child could be playing. Like I had no idea what was happening. So this game has 6 different endings. 5 normal ones and then the last is a special X ending which you unlock only after getting all the other endings. And I beat this game twice, once on the PS2 and then once on the PSP. And uh, since this game story is kind of like a weird Schrodinger's cat thing where like all the endings are true and not true at the same time, I thought it would be, it would be best to just go through uh, my original playthrough story chapter by chapter and then we'll go through the, uh, all the other endings and just like point out the differences between the endings. So without further ado, Strange Loop Industries presents Shadow of Memories. So right off the bat, in the first cutscene of the game, the main character dies. He's then transported to this weird room in the void and a disembodied voice of fucking Mario tells him he died. I'm not kidding, the voice actor for this character is actually Charles Martinet of, you know, fucking Super Mario fame. Anyways, Mario then gives the main character a chance to prevent his death, but initially we refuse the offer and honestly I love that, like he says the most insane line ever and just straight up refuses his offer. You're the big S, the devil. In exchange for your immortal soul and all that, am I right? But then he does a 180 and begs Mario to save him. I don't want to die yet. Please, help me. Mario then just throws the fucking time trial device on the ground like it's trash or something and also the time machine is called the fucking digipad for whatever reason. And then Mario says this to the main character. You can't solve, you can't the, solve real the real problem by just problem using by just it when you're about to die. to die. It's better to make use of it to remove the underlying cause of your death. Oh yeah, the main character's name or you know our name is Ike Kush. During this beginning cutscene Mario calls us Ike. I honestly I can't remember where we find out that, that our last name is Kush, but it is. The full name is Ike Kush, you know, Kush like David. So yeah, that's good to know. Ike is then transported back to his time about half an hour before his unfortunate demise. He wakes up in a cafe and then everyone points and laughs at him for falling asleep. Also, oh my god, I just noticed this while making this video, but the crowd noises in the cafe are terrifying. It's like a cult chanting sound or something. Okay, let's talk about the actual gameplay of Shadow of Memories now. Or you know, lack thereof. So in this game time constantly flows as you see in the top right corner. Like literally every single interaction and cutscene costs time. And when you finish talking with someone for example you get like a pop up of like plus 30 seconds or something. And that's important because the whole concept of the game is that you know the exact time of your death so you're able to prevent it. But you gotta be smart with your time. The thing is though that was never really a problem. I think I ran out of time and died maybe once or twice during my two playthroughs, so it's more of like a neat little detail than an actual mechanic. 
Back to the story now. Ike stumbles onto a fortune teller's store that was like right next to the cafe and decides to enter. He asks the fortune teller lady to tell him his fortune and not pull any punches. The fortune teller tells Ike that he will die in half an hour and gives him like hints basically on how to prevent it. So in every chapter you are able to stop by the fortune teller to get a specific time of your death and sometimes she even gives you hints on how to prevent it. And then after talking to the fortune teller, the digipad in Ike's inventory starts glowing. Speaking of the inventory, Ike seems to already have a few things in there. Most of the things will either come into play later on in the game or not at all. But the one thing that's of use already is the map. And you can check the map at any time to see like where you and all 9 interactable buildings are. The funny thing is though, half of those buildings are completely unrelated to the entire story and game. Like for example the church I only visited once out of curiosity and in the second playthrough I forgot it was even there. There's like only a handful of buildings that you visit more than once and that are of any like actual importance. And looking at the map we can also see the name of the town, Lebensbaum. And the entirety of this game is like set in this town, consisting of the town square and then a few streets and alleys surrounding the square. And Lebensbaum actually means the tree of life in German. Which is honestly fitting for what the game's story is going for. It's very obvious that this game is like set in German, like literally every street on the map is written in German and the architecture of the town is like distinctly European. And honestly, like they nailed it. This whole town is very well made and each time period like version of the town is really cool looking. Like I'm really glad they managed to make the town charming since it's literally like the only environment in the game. The digipad glowing means that we can use it now to go to a different time period because time travel in Shadow of Memory is like different than most time travel machines. You can only use the digipad to go to a specific time period that the digipad itself decides for you. So like throughout most of the game the digipad decides for you when and where to go. And the digipad menu is where you decide where to time travel to and it's such a weird menu. Like it's giving strong like Y2K vibes and I love it. It's so good. Like the way each time period is just like this deep, trippy, void, chasm block that you have to select is such a weird and wacky design choice. I, I genuinely, I love it. Okay back to the story yet again. The moment you learn the exact time of your death the digipad reacts and now you can travel half an hour back in time and you gotta somehow gather a crowd of people which will prevent the killer from stabbing you in the back. And this is such a stupid roundabout way of preventing your own death. I feel like you don't even need a time machine to do this. Like just stand next to a person, any person. Or you know like turn around. There's so many like better more proactive ways of preventing your own death than this. And this becomes like such a pattern in this game. Like most of the deaths in this game you can just prevent just with the knowledge of how you die. You don't even need to like do introduce any time traveling bullshittery. You travel back in time and tell a handful of people to gather at the time square to see a performer juggle. Oh, by the way, during this time you can visit your past self sleeping in the cafe and if you interact with yourself, you'll cause a time paradox and die by touching yourself. <laughs> so I guess touching yourself is a big no-no in the world of Shadow of Memories. Anyway, once you told everyone that there will be a performance at the Times Square, you go forward half an hour in time and then there's a juggler with a crowd of people watching him. The killer is scared off by the crowd and Ike decides to go visit the fortune teller again. There was someone behind me. Oh, but it looks like the crowd scared him off. Oh, and that fortune teller, she told me to come back. I should go look her up again. Okay, so Ike visits the fortune teller and she tells him that he's still in danger and that he'll now die at 3 p.m. Ike is shocked by this saying, You mean I still haven't gotten to the root of the problem? And like, no shit dude, you just scared off the killer, like why would that be the root of the problem? Okay, so this chapter is kinda stupid and really, really short. It took me just 7 minutes to beat on my first ever playthrough. So what you're supposed to do is run around the town until you stumble onto a bar that's burning. In front of it is a crying child and he says that it's his grandpa's bar and that he's stuck there. He then begs Ike to go in and save him. If you say no, you just kinda stand around for the rest of the chapter. So you're obviously supposed to go in and the moment you get inside you die to the flames, I guess. Then you shortly visit the abyss room and are sent back to life again. But this time you respawn already in the burning bar. And then once you are able to control Ike again, 
again, the digipad starts glowing which means you can use it to travel back in time. This time the digipad wants you to travel an hour back in time before the fire happened. Once you're in the past you see a suspicious person hanging around the bar. You try chasing the person but Ike gives up like 3 steps in. We then notice like a little fire trap or whatever in the corner behind the bar and put it out. After you save the bar or whatever you go back to the present and the burning bar is slowly replaced by the normal not on fire bar. And that's it. Chapter's done. But it's so stupid though. Like couldn't the person just go back after you left and set the bar on fire again if they like really wanted the bar to burn. Also looking back I realized I never knew what the cause of death even was in this chapter because on both of my playthroughs I just speed through this chapter. So I specifically replayed this chapter and just waited around until 3pm aka my time of death and it turns out that Ike's cause of death is... <laughs> It is difficult, after all, isn't it, to change one's very destiny? Nothing? Like, he literally just falls over and dies. There's like no explanation or anything. So I think what happened was, is that they wanted this chapter's death to be, you know, Ike burning alive in the bar, but they couldn't think of a way to, like, make you be there unless, you know, you walk in yourself. So, like, if you refuse to walk in, and the timer runs out, you just fall over and die. And that's like such a red flag, I guess. Because like, it's only chapter 1. And already they're like running out of ways to explain the main gimmick of the game. Like, you know, wacky little deaths. And already there's like no explanation for that. But yeah, that's chapter 1. Uh, very weird. Very lame. On to chapter 2. Chapter 2. So with the bar fire prevented, Ike is approached in the Times Square by the waitress from the cafe Ike visited at the beginning of the game. She then tries to give Ike a precious red jewel or stone of some kind and a lighter, saying he forgot them at the cafe. Ike claims that the jewel isn't his, but the lighter is, so the lighter is at your inventory now. Ike now takes this opportunity to invalidate the waitress's feelings, saying how he has it much harder than she does. I feel so tired. You can't be tired from something that simple. There's a lot of people out there whose lives are a lot tougher. Well, like me. Ike is then promptly stabbed from the back and dies. <laughs> when you respawn, you have no option but to start the conversation again with the waitress at the Times Square. And this time around, Dana the waitress turns into a real yap and stops you whenever you try to leave so you're just stuck there listening to her yap while the clock ticks away. This is such a ridiculous setup that I kinda like it. Like you're too awkward to cut someone off and leave even though there's like someone right behind you waiting to kill you. But in the middle of the conversation the digipad starts acting up again meaning you can go back in time now. And the time period that the digipad selected is the year 1580 for whatever reason. And since you aren't able to take one step away from Dana you're forced to use the digipad in front of her causing the both of you to travel back in time to the 16th century. I guess time travel next to someone is a big no-no so we'll have to be careful of that in the future. Keep that in mind for later, wink, wink. Anyways, the next scene is in the ye old Times Square. A few old hags are bullying and blackmailing a girl for dressing up as a real slut. Suddenly, Ike appears in front of them, but Dana, for some reason, is nowhere to be found. Ike manages to scare off everyone but the girl by using his black magic sorcery to summon fire. AKA, Ike just, you know, used his lighter that he just got. Lucky him, you know, wow. What, what a crazy coincidence that he got the lighter right before he needed it. I'm just yanking this game's chain because you can also actually use the cell phone if you want. Both will like work. But I feel like the lighter is more, you know, fitting, more iconic. Like, you know, look fire from my palm. Okay, sorry, this was a weird tangent. The girl introduces herself as Margaret and thanks Ike for saving her. Ike then asks her if she saw a girl anywhere. Margaret says she hasn't, but she offers to take Ike to her home since it's dark out and he can explain everything there. You follow Margaret to her home or the alchemist's house as it's referred to on the map and she introduces you to her bedridden mother Helen. Helen then points out that Ike's voice is remarkably like Margaret's father's. My, your friend's voice is remarkably like your father's. Hmm, 
Do you think so? And keep that in mind for later. Way later. It's revealed that Margaret's father is an alchemist who is holed up in the basement, consumed by his research, even while his wife is like super sick, and his kids are scared of what will happen to their mother. Speaking of kids, Margaret's brother Hugo is also introduced in this scene. And for the first sentence, he was an annoying little shit dude. Like, his voice is so annoying, and so is he. The best way I can describe him is that he's basically Denny from the room. Just a creep. Just a psychotic little creep. Hugo then points out how weird our clothes are, and literally starts like patting down Ike. Like, why would he do that? That's so creepy, dude. And because of Hugo's patting, the digipad falls out of Ike's pocket and onto the ground. Hugo then leaps to the digipad like a fucking golem or something, and then Ike tells Hugo to be careful because it's a very complicated and delicate machine as he puts the digipad back in his pocket. Hugo then tries like guessing what the machine does, and he actually fucking guesses that it's a time travel machine, like on his third try. And he then starts badgering and questioning Ike like crazy. Thankfully, his mom's awful death rattle cough puts a stop to that as Hugo immediately goes to check on his mom. The mom tells Hugo not to bother Ike and says that he's just like his father. This causes Hugo to rant about his no good son of a gun father, saying how all he cares about is his research and that he didn't even notice when he was born. Margaret then asks Ike what the girl he's looking for looks like, and Hugo takes this as a cue to tease Ike about it. Ike responds that he doesn't really know what she looks like and that he's just met her. Margaret starts pouting when Ike said that, which makes no sense to me. Like, I'm pretty sure they were going for Margaret liking Ike and being jealous that he's looking for another girl, but he literally says he doesn't even know her and describes her like really poorly. <laughs> Since we didn't get any information from here, Ike decides to go out and look for Dana elsewhere. And this is finally the first point in this chapter where we're allowed to actually move around. So we are able to explore the 1500s version of Lebensbaum, and it's actually really cool. It's dark right now, so it's kinda tough to see, but like everything has this sepia color filter over it, so everything looks a bit more painterly. It's honestly a really nice touch. So this chapter is where I realized that this game is straight up a classic point and click adventure game, where like the solution is just a nonsensical string of interactions that has nothing to do with you know what you're actually doing because I was stuck for so long in this chapter because I thought you know I had to look for Dana because that's what Ike said he's going going outside to look for Dana instead what we're supposed to do is stop the fucking tree in the Times Square from ever being planted so that your killer won't be able to hide behind the tree before he kills you and that is so stupid on so many levels first of all you end up replacing the tree with a statue so the killer could just hide behind the statue instead of the tree but he doesn't and he could also just hide behind like the gazillion other buildings that are around Ike. If anything, Ike did the killer a favor because the tree actually had the least amount of cover in that area. So now you know, like the killer is forced to be more strategic. But no, unplanting the tree is enough for the killer and that's so stupid. Stupid. Not only is the solution incredibly stupid, so is the way you go about it. So the guy who's on like tree planted duty only listens to orders from the squire. So in order to get him to listen to you, you need to acquire the squire's crest. But the squire's crest is like hanging from the wall of the lord's manor, and the way to the lord's manor is locked. So first you have to get a ladder that's just like leaning up against the butcher's door, and then you have to talk to the guy next to the lord's manor to get the key from him, but he won't give you the key for free. He wants something in return. And honestly, Honestly, I just went like one by one through my inventory hoping I had something that he likes and turns out I did like he wanted the postcard that I had and that is just truly random because like when you talk to him he doesn't mention like oh I like art or this and that it's just like oh it's just a random thing you have in your inventory so now we're able to enter the Lord's Manor climb up the manor using the ladder and take the squire's crest and then finally we go back to the tree planting guy and present him the squire's crest saying that the Lord changed his mind we can then choose between like erecting a statue or planting flowers instead but honestly i went with a statue because it's so much cooler usually i actually like these roundabout puzzles in adventure games but this one really annoyed me because the whole point was to look for dana and this is just a completely different task and when you finally do get the guy to not plant the tree ike literally just leaves this timeline like he doesn't even look for dana so dana is somewhere back there in the past Oh, what have I done to get her involved in this? I promise I'll find you. Please hang in there. Until then. Today is a good day to quit. I don't want to die.
And then the chapter ends. Poor fucking Dana, dude. Chapter 3. So I died as soon as the chapter started this time. Usually I actually like that. Because then I know how I died, which would hopefully help me, you know, figure out how to prevent my own death. But this chapter's death is like so random and like there's no clues as to how to prevent it. It's just pointless. A random fucking was just drops on Ike's head and it kills him like instantly. And that's it. Super helpful. Anyway, when you respawn, it's 5 p.m. and you get a call from a Mr. Eckert asking if you're gonna visit his museum or not. Seems like Ike had like some plans to visit the museum before all this death prevention stuff started happening. Ike says he's gonna drop by the museum, so now we know where to start this chapter. We make our way to the museum and enter Mr. Eckert's office. His office is absolutely covered in kittens. Like he has like at least six cats in this room and he doesn't elaborate on that at all. Eckert then asks Ike why he visited and if he wanted to look at the paintings again. Ike said that he originally wanted to but now he's curious about alchemy and asks if this town ever had any like famous alchemists. I gotta say I don't understand the logic of asking this question. I mean yeah Ike did stumble onto the daughter of an alchemist in the 1500s. But the digipad took him there because of the whole tree planting thing, not because of the alchemy thing. So why is he asking pointless questions when he should be, you know, running around trying to stop his own death? Spoiler alert, like, the alchemist and just alchemy in general becomes a very big uh, part of the plot. But Ike doesn't know that yet. I feel like this is yet another nonsensical move to just propel the story forward. Like, there was no actual, like, lore reason for Ike to waste his time on this. But Eckert tells him that there used to be a Dr. Wagner who was a famous and skilled alchemist and he also gives Ike an old book about the alchemy and the alchemists of this town. Okay, now Eckert is elaborating on the mass of kittens. Turns out his cat had a litter and he's trying to give them out to people and asks Ike if he knows anyone who would want to adopt a kitten. Ike starts leaving the museum and he's approached by Mario. And look, he has a body this time. He's a weird little demon twink looking fella. Mario introduces himself as homunculus, so he definitely has something to do with alchemy. But we're going to keep calling him Mario. It's more personal that way. But this cutscene is like really weird because Mario dropped by to basically ask Ike how his investigation is doing. But for some reason, Ike is acting as if he just met him. And is convinced Mario wants to kill him and then to prove that he's friendly, Mario transports Ike to 1979 without like any warning. How is that proof of anything? If anything, Ike would be even more freaked out now. It genuinely makes no sense to me. But Ike drops in front of a man who definitely noticed us. And then another man runs out of the museum happily cheering and dancing. Turns out that's young Mr. Eckert and he's celebrating because his wife just gave birth. And then when Eckert runs back inside the museum, Ike notices that the digipad isn't working anymore. At this point, Mario taunts him saying, How about that? Just a small example of what I can do. How will you get home now? You better solve that on your own. You should be able to handle a little thing like that, Harry. How is this helpful? Why is Mario doing this? Anyways, the reason the digipad doesn't work anymore is because it's out of energy. So we need to pick up some more energy cells to time travel. Now, I didn't mention this mechanic before because I was saving it for this specific moment. Since the beginning of the game, every time you time travel, the digipad uses up a single energy cell. And you can actually see how many energy cells you have at any time in the upper right corner. This mechanic didn't really make sense to me because there's no scale or anything attached to getting energy cells. They're just green thingies around town that you can pick up and each time period has a few set places where you can find an energy cell. But I wasn't too worried about it because you started with a ton of energy cells and as long as you make sure to pick up a few cells here and there, you don't even have to think about the digipad energy. All of that goes out the window with this chapter. But now, because fucking Super Mario over here drained our battery, you either have to spend a stupid amount of time fully refilling the digipad energy or just make sure you grab an energy cell every time you time travel anywhere. And this is so obviously just to pad out the game time. It's so annoying. Because of this stupid moment where Mario drains your battery, I know exactly where each energy cell drop is in each time period. And I don't need this knowledge, no one does. So, back to the story. Once you successfully charge your digipad, Ike travels back to the present and he's met by Mario who taunts him some more. Well, what do you think? Are you a little more convinced?
Convinced of what? What was the point of this, you sicko? Ike runs away from Mario and goes up to Eckert and asks him about his daughter. Eckert is so shocked by that question that he bumps into and breaks a vase that was next to him. Hold on, that's the vase that kills Ike this chapter. Yup, and Ike doesn't acknowledge it at all. Is he the killer? Or did someone else steal the vase and kill Ike with it? Who knows? Who cares? Ike certainly doesn't. Eckert says that he did have a daughter, but that some madman kidnapped her and killed his wife sometime after their daughter was born. Damn. If only we had a time machine, that way we could stop this from happening. Oh well. Ike goes back down to talk to Mario and now he believes him, but like this was totally unnecessary. We already knew Mario was powerful, like he already gave us the fucking time machine and the way to go back after we died. But Mario drops some interesting lore near the end of this cutscene. If you die. I'll be in trouble too, you know. I don't really get it, but are you sure about this? I mean, I can't do anything except for myself. But that's all right. It's the way things should be. As you can see, my body is very fragile and won't let me do much. I picked up a baby the other day and it was really quite terrible, absolutely exhausted me. I won't ever do that again. I almost forgot. You will see that red stone again sometime. When you do, could you acquire it somehow? I would like you to give it to someone called Dr. Wagner. That's all for now. And that concludes chapter 3. Chapter 4 Once again, this chapter begins with Ike's death. At 8pm, Ike gets stabbed in the back and dies. Before respawning Ike, Mario suggests putting something like an iron plate under Ike's clothing to avoid getting stabbed. Or he could turn around, face his killer, punch me in the fucking nose, something, anything. So Ike is transported an hour before his death. He decides to read the alchemy book given to him by Eckert and notices a black and white photo that's in the book. That causes the digipad to react and now Ike is able to travel to the year 1902. And this time period has like a really nice touch where everything except for Ike is in black and white. Get it? Like black and white photos. Okay, so Ike goes to the museum and sees a man standing in front of it. He then asks the man if he works at the museum, but the man is confused by that question as he claims that this is his home, not a fucking museum. He explained that as a descendant of the town squire, he inherited this castle of a house, and now that there's only him and his two children, this house is like way too big for them. The man agrees with Ike, saying that this house should be actually a museum, and he pretty much decides then and there that he's turning the house into a museum. The man finally introduces himself as Alfred Brum and invites Ike for tea or something. So in celebration of the house turning into a museum, Alfred decides to take a family photo of the house with Ike in it for some reason. While Alfred goes to fetch the photographer, Alfred's daughter Sibylla notices that Ike's jacket is torn and offers to mend it. Jesus, this is such a weird, inconsequential, like, turn of events. Like, who cares about any of this? What does this matter? Poor little Ike is cold after taking off the jacket, so the daughter tells Ike to put on the costume that's in the room while he waits. Turns out that the costume he put on is just like the juggler's costume from the prologue. Wow! Ike notices an interesting looking toy in the room, and Sibylla says it's a decorated egg that has paper inside so you can write notes in it. Hearing that, Ike gets a brilliant idea. So he writes down a note addressed to his past self, saying to find and take a frying pan. He then time travels to the events of the prologue when the juggler appeared. So the juggler was future Ike all along. Then we see a cutscene of Ike traveling back in time and juggling at the Times Square. But in the middle of juggling, he just drops all the balls and chucks the egg with the note inside at past Ike. What on earth? There's something in here. Please, let it work. There's a letter inside. To Ike. Please get something like a thick iron plate. What the? At first, I was actually really furious by this when I first played it, because it's a completely different turn of events of what actually happened. Like, in pro in the prologue, the juggler didn't throw anything at me. Like, he just kept juggling and then I went away. But, as it turns out, if during chapter 1, when you had to enter the burning bar, if instead of going into the bar, first you went back to the town square, juggler Ike would still be there. And then you'd see him, you know, juggle, juggle, then throw the egg at you with the note inside, and then 
you can go back to the burning bar and pick up the frying pan in the burning bar and you know pocket it but like that's still it's less of a plot scene but it's still pretty shitty because my ike never experienced that like he didn't see any of that and still somehow he magically got a frying pan like why they make that optional they should have just made that part of the cutscene it would have been cool like well what is this ah it, it's all making sense later in the game but no they just like made it optional and in universe because a little timer at the at the top you can see that the time difference between the prologue and the chapter one two hours passed so that means juggler Ike has been juggling there for two hours but in the cutscene in the chapter four cutscene he just mid original juggle he just drops you the, uh, the egg so it's still super fucky another thing that baffled me while playing this is the realization that this game would much rather play itself than let me play it like literally 90 percent of this chapter was just cutscenes the only agency i had was walking up to the museum slash house and then the rest you know was just the story i wouldn't really mind that usually because like I, I understand that this is like a adventure game, so the story is the gameplay. But like in the case of Shadow of Memories, the story is really not good. <laughs> it's like every single chapter has multiple plot holes. It is so flawed, so it just you know left me more annoyed than intrigued. But I, we gotta we gotta move on. Like this this video is already way too long, and we're not even halfway done. I came to that realization when I got to the part where Sibylla explained what the toy egg was. Like I connected the dots and knew what I had to do and I was expecting the game to give me back control any minute now so I can travel back to 2001 and perform as the juggler to you know give the egg to past me. But the cutscene just kept going and going. Like I didn't get to participate in any of that. After Ike is done with his juggler gig, he travels back to 1902, takes a family photo while in the juggler costume and then Sibylla notices that he has a frying pan in his jacket while handing it back to him. So now we know that Ike's bullshit time travel fuckery worked and he has finally acquired a killer's worst nightmare, a frying pan, Wow, we. As soon as Ike travels back to the present, a 5 second timer starts counting down. We then quickly equip the frying pan and get stabbed. Ike then again falls to the floor from the blow, but this time he gets up, his fucking genius Tom and Jerry ass idea worked, apparently, for some fucking reason. <sighs> this is such fucking slippery bullshit dude, like wouldn't the killer fucking notice the sound of, you know, the knife hitting iron? Or like the blood not appearing or Ike literally just getting up half a second after he was stabbed. Like that's so stupid man but who cares? The game doesn't, the fucking writers don't, whatever. End of chapter, who cares? Chapter five. It is now past 8.30pm and Ike is hungry so he decides to stop by the previously burning bar to grab a bite to eat. I guess it's not that weird to be hungry at, at a time like this but I feel like thanks to the adrenaline and like you know the fear of being chased by a killer getting something to it would be like the least of my worries but you know whatever i guess to each their own so ike enters the bar and orders the special while he's waiting for the food ike started reading the alchemy book he got from eckert to pass the time so now we got some sweet lore on the homunculus and the philosopher's stone it turns out the stone dana tried to give to ike was the philosopher's stone all along we also got to hear some lore on Dr. Wagner, aka Margaret's dad. ...prowess was known throughout the region. What secured his lasting fame was no doubt the manner in which he met his end. Amid rumors of his engagement in an experiment of great magnitude and duration, Dr. Wagner's house was shaken by a thunderous explosion. And the alchemist himself was never seen again. Oh yeah, also, someone fucking put some poison or something in Ike's food. Eh. I'm sure it's nothing, right? Right? Yeah. So after Ike, you know, chows down, he exits the bar and is met by Mario, the homunculus, who asks him about the book he's carrying. Ike offers the book to Mario, but he flinches, saying to keep that book away from him because he doesn't like the pentagram looking sign on the cover. Interesting. Mario drops some sweet lore on us yet again. Dr. Wagner, who is mentioned in the book, had a daughter, and she's a very significant figure to you. What? Like, she's one of my ancestors? Please, don't forget the red stone. I'm looking for it too, but I believe that you are the one who is fated to acquire it. 
Getting your hands on it will be a step towards avoiding your own death as well. And as soon as Mario leaves, Ike fucking drops to his knees and dies. Like literally, he just plops. So yeah, th that food was like definitely poisoned. Mario then says that we were probably poisoned, uh, no shit, by the sea hair in the food and says this. You need to look into the details yourself. Why don't you try the library? Oops, oops. I guess it's the art museum now. So now we respawn like right after Ike ate and this chapter's goal is to find the antidote for the sea hair poison. And yet again, a stupid, fucking idiotic, easily avoidable death. Like why didn't Mario just respawn us right before we ate? Like this is the only time in the whole game where he respawns us 10 seconds before the death. Usually it's like literally an hour, half an hour. But this time, oh wow, you know, you, I... I guess his magic is running out or something. I don't know. It's fucking stupid. It's stupid. And it's so super avoidable, man. Like, just don't eat, asshole. But no, we have to do this roundabout bullshit again. Mario mentioning the library and the art museum was a hint to go back to 1902, because there we find Albert second guessing himself about turning the house into a museum. Like, he says that he could also turn it into a library and ask us for our opinion. And since we need the info on the poison, I says that he should turn it into a library instead. If we go to the present after this, the museum is replaced by a library and now we can enter the library to research the poison and hopefully find an antidote. Ike is able to find a book on sea hair poison and discovers that there used to be an antidote, but it no longer exists in our time. Thankfully, this is a time travel story, so we have a time machine! So we decide to travel back to the 1500s, but since we uncovered new information in the alchemy book, the digipad lets us only travel to the year 1584, which is four years after Ike first visited the 1500s. So we travel specifically to August 13th, 1584, the day Dr. Wagner's house exploded because of his experiments going wrong. We try to enter the house to see what happened, but there's a dog guarding the house. And like, why is there a dog here? They never had a dog. Like, this is such obvious game padding. So instead of just entering the house, we now have to go first to the butchers, ask the lady working there for some scraps of meat, and then she casually flirts with us, gives us the scraps of meat, and then we can go back to the house, give the scraps of meat to the dog, and finally enter the house. Inside the house, we see a clearly disheveled Mario. We ask him what's he doing there, and then Mario responds with this. And disappears. Weird. We find a key to the lab on the floor. There's nothing for us here in this specific year anymore, so we use the digipad and now we can go back two years in the past to, you know, 1582 because 1584 minus 2 is 1582. Good job. Ike makes a beeline to the alchemist house and using the lab key, he goes downstairs to where Margaret's father, Dr. Wagner, is conducting his research. Wagner is immediately hostile towards us and is telling us, you know, to leave. I just ignores that question and asks Wagner if he's doing research for the homunculus. Wagner then freaks out over us knowing about homunculus and starts pressing us for info, but he butters up to Ike real fast after we say that we might be able to get the Philosopher's Stone for him. Wagner then asks Ike to give him just a tiny piece of the stone if he managed to find it, and with that Ike just goes back upstairs. And then just as Ike goes upstairs, Margaret enters the house. She asks Ike if he ended up finding Dana and that she tried looking for her too. Margaret is like the only person at this point who gives a shit about Dana. Like Ike is over it. Like completely. He's like, it probably took him a second to even remember like, oh, who's Dana? Oh shit, yeah, the girl I fucking left in the 1500s. Margaret then catches us up on what's going on with their family. Mother passed away, you know. Oh yes. Hugo's still at school. He started this year, and he's gotten serious about learning. I think he's decided to follow in our father's footsteps. We try to leave the house, but Margaret asks us to stay because she wants to hear about the future. So she offers to walk with us as she needs to make some deliveries anyways. They end up chatting about the future for a bit, and then while waiting for Margaret to make a delivery, Ike notices someone who actually looks like Dana, so he gives chase. For three whole seconds. Unsurprisingly, he didn't find her, but that's okay, he clearly doesn't even care about her. He meets back up with Margaret, and only after blabbing the whole walk about the future, he realizes, like, oh shit, I probably shouldn't talk about the future, like in fear of messing up the continuum or whatever. And once they make their way back to Margaret's home, she begs Ike to let her visit the future. She seems to be, like, almost obsessed with Ike's time. She even says this. But I feel such a strong pull towards it. Won't you take me to your time? To that, Ike says it's not possible, as that will mess up the timeline. And then when Margaret asks why, we get our first branch in the storyline. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This game has six endings, and the first 
branch in the story's path is at the very end of chapter 5. Of 8 chapters, by the way. So no matter what, the majority of the playthrough is going to be exactly the same. Very fun. Very cool. So here I can either say I think you may be an ancestor of mine. Or oh, nothing. For my first playthrough, I chose to say nothing because I hope to like avoid the whole typical ancestor time travel cliche bullshittery. Margaret says that she was joking anyways, since she knows traveling to the future would mess it up. And then just as Ike tries to leave, Hugo enters the house. And this shitty little fucking creep says that he was following and listening in to Margaret and Ike like this whole time. Even during their walk and everything. Oh, what a gross little cockroach. I hate him. His voice actor is hilarious though. Like he's clearly not giving a shit and really playing it up. I love it. Margaret then outs Hugo for being a giga creep by asking him if he still carries around mother's lock of hair. Hearing that, Hugo absolutely loses his shit. Like he even kicks a chair and oh my god, that chair went flying. Then thanks to Hugo making things awkward, Ike decides to leave. But Margaret stops him to give him a comb as a thank you for telling her stories of the future. Ah, oh, how romantic, how sweet. And with that, Ike exits the house. Oh fuck, I completely forgot, like the whole reason we came here was to get the antidote. So Ike goes back in and asks Margaret if she knows about the sea hair antidote. She says that, you know, they know about it and that they have it, so she gives the antidote to Ike. So now all that's left in this chapter is to go back to the present and gulp down that bad boy. But before we do that, I want to take this opportunity and report on the little side activities I did during this chapter. Because at first I didn't really know what I had to do. I end up running around a lot and actually I stumbled onto like uh, two side quests of the game. First, if we go back to 1902 and talk to Sibylla again, Ike learns that she's actually very lonely and that she would love to have a pet or something to play with. And then I remembered Eckert asking us if we know anyone who would like a cat. So we asked Sibylla if she likes cats and she says that she absolutely adores cats. We then go back to the present and to the museum slash library and Ike literally just pockets a kitten. <laughs> like he just adds it to his inventory, like in his jacket. I I'm not sure that's safe for the kitten, dude. Afterwards, we again go to 1902 and give the cat to Sibylla, causing that cat to actually be its own ancestor. That's cool. And then the second interesting discovery is made by talking to the bar owner in the present. He basically starts yapping at us about his grandchildren, saying that they're very young and that they only start to learn how to walk. But hold on, then who was the crying kid asking us to save his grandpa from the burning bar? Interesting. Okay, that concludes the side stuff. After getting the antidote, Ike travels back to the present, and as soon as he starts feeling the effects of the poison, we need to use the sea hair antidote in our inventory. And yippee, Ike lives to see another hour! Chapter 5 complete! Chapter 6! It's now 11pm, and the chapter opens with a pair of hot babes. One of them works at the city hall. So the babes are looking at the movie poster and are saying that the movie and its director are like super lame. And that they're totally passing on the flick. The smoking babes leave the site. Ike then approaches the movie poster and it's a poster for The Meditating Man. And even Ike thinks it's a snooze fest. Okay, this sounds pretty dull. Suddenly, Ike gets fucking run over by a car. Then Maya responds us literally 10 seconds before Ike gets run over, so we quickly use the digipad. And look at that, we unlocked a new year. The distant year of 1980. That's one year after Eckert's daughter was born, for those of you at home trying to keep track of the timeline and lore. So this chapter's wacky Rube Goldberg machine type way of preventing Ike's death is to basically run into the guy who made the movie, The Meditating Man, and I guess just convince him to make a better movie. In February of 1980, you appear before the man who noticed you the last time we dropped in this time period. Turns out this guy has been meditating, trying to manifest Ike to appear in front of him again. And now that he did it, he's decided to make a movie about this. We pretty much tell the guy that that's a horrible idea for a movie. And instead, we suggest a time travel story about a man trying to stop his own murder. The would-be filmmaker then says that the movie needs something more than that. Giving us the choice between adding in a love story or a thriller spin. And as far as I know, this choice doesn't affect the main story at all. I think it's just like a choice just to give you a choice, you know, like for shits and giggles. The film guy then says it'll take some time to make a movie this ambitious, so he'll have to work up the corporate food chain before he can make it, but he'll make it his life's mission or whatever. He then begs us for our time traveling power for whatever reason. Like why is he suddenly interested in that? That came completely out of left field. 
Ike saw like ew no and runs away from him. While Ike walks around the snow covered town of 1980 he hears a gunshot and decides to get closer to investigate. And also like while we're on the topic of you know walking around the snow covered town like this is such a small part of the game but they made a special really good looking like snow trudging walk cycle. I gotta say it's really cool I really like it. When we follow the sound of the gunshot we find a dying woman asking where her baby is. Shortly after that, a young Eckert runs in and it all starts to make sense. This is the day that Eckert's wife was killed and his daughter was kidnapped. And that's good actually, because now we can finally, you know, prevent that from happening. Right? 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 Uh, kinda. In this playthrough, definitely not, but in general it is possible, but not in any way that feels rewarding. Because, you know, it's shadow of memories, of course. So Ike does decide to go back like 10 minutes into the past to try and prevent Eckert's wife's death, and he finds her walking down the street carrying her baby. We try to warn her not to go that way because it's dangerous, and depending on what specifically we say, she'll either say like, oh okay, make a turn, but then <laughs> unmake that turn once we leave, or she'll straight up just say like, ew, shut up creep, and just keep on marching into the fucking Batman's parents' alley. And then after going 10 minutes, into the future to see if you manage to save Eckert's wife, Ike is surprised to see that absolutely nothing has changed and she's still dead and babyless. A couple of people form around her and one guy says that he saw you hang out with the woman right before she died. So now you're getting surrounded and no one is letting you leave before the cops get here. And then the digipad starts blinking rapidly. And that means that you gotta get the hell out of Dodge now. So they leave us no choice but to use the digipad to travel back to the present in front of them. Ike uses the digipad and just simply bails. But hold on, the last time Ike used the digipad in front of someone, poor Dana was transported with him into the 1500s and is still stuck there somewhere. But now it doesn't mean anything. Cool. Awesome. So in my playthrough I tried stopping Eckert's wife twice because there are you know two dialogue options when trying to stop her and neither of them worked. And after trying both dialogue options, Mario even told me that changing my fate is almost impossible, let alone someone else's, and that I should just give up. So I did. Like I thought that was the game telling me you can't change this outcome. But it turns out if you kept trying you actually can stop her from getting killed. But you never find out who the killer was and on top of that her baby still gets kidnapped. And like what the fuck? I understand, like, the baby kidnapping part is important to the story later on, but apparently the killer part just isn't important. Uh, like, if you prevent the killer, cool, the story isn't affected in any, like, major way. And if not, whatever, oh well, she, she's dead. Who cares? And that's so stupid. Like, why even write the whole killer part? Like, why not write, make it so that she gets run over by a car, you know, it's like an accident you can prevent, so that's like, in that case it doesn't matter who the person who actually killed her is, but this way specifically someone wanted her dead, her and her baby dead. And that isn't important to the story at all. Man, I really wanna like this game, but it's just so full of plot holes and just nonsensical story beats. Anyway, you decide this is too much trouble and just bail back to the present. When you disappear, we see that the filmmaker fella saw all this transpire, which inspired him even more to make a movie, but this is gonna be so much more ambitious and that he's gonna need even more time and experience to make this movie. As I understand it, the point of this cutscene was to explain why it took the filmmaker guy 21 fucking years to make the movie. But if you remember, like he got the idea for the meditating man a year ago and the movie came out only in 2001 so it actually took him 22 fucking years for the meditating man. So this cutscene doesn't prove anything, he's just a slow guy when it comes to making movies. So all this cutscene did was just point out that he's a fucking selfish sociopath. Like he's literally witnessing a horrible fucking murder scene and the baby was kidnapping and he was like yes fucking yes this is gonna be such a cool movie like this is gonna be a fucking blockbuster yay for me anyways Ike goes back to right before he was run over by a car and now the meditating man poster is replaced by a poster for the time of reckoning an even bigger group of hot smoking babes crowd around the poster saying how excited they are this time for the movie causing the mystery person in the car to get scared by the crowd and drive away 
This fucking killer has like a phobia of crowds or something. But yeah, Ike has managed to prevent his death in yet another stupidly elaborate way. And right before the chapter ends, Ike gets a call from Eckert saying that he urgently needs the alchemy book back and that he'll be waiting in the tower next to the library. I'll be waiting at the library tower. It's now 1am and the chapter begins with Ike entering the tower and realizing he's been locked in. We got no choice but to go up the tower so we mosey on up. Pretty much as soon as Ike reaches the top of the tower he gets pushed off and falls to his death. Yeah, that's this chapter's death and oh my god dude that one really fucked me up. Like this one definitely makes Watch Mojo's top 3 preventable deaths. The top of the tower is massive, it's not like it's just the edge and nothing else. He could just wait in the center of the tower for his killer or like just not go up. I can think of a million easily done ways to prevent this death. And do you think one of those ways is how the game wants you to stop Ike's death? No, of course not. Instead, Ike decides that he'll go back one day in past and enter the tower so that he can tie a rope around the railing. His plan is to literally catch the rope mid-fall and then climb back up. This fucking moron. Like this isn't even a possible way to prevent your own death. Like you can't grab onto the rope mid fucking fall. And even if you were able to catch it, you'd get fucking insane rope burn. Like your just fucking skin would get torn to shreds and you'll still fall. Like, oh my God, this chapter made me go insane. Like I hated how this, I, I hate it. I hate it. I really, really do. It's fucking ass. Okay. It's ass, 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 ass. So we go back one day, pick up the rope that's in the tower, tie it around the fence, and then travel back to the present. Now the cutscene plays out and Ike successfully catches the rope as he's falling. This guy must be superhuman or something, cause that's insane. But oh no, this is all the rope, so it breaks from the impact and he still falls to his death. And like, I feel even that is bullshit. He was now hanging halfway off the tower. Even if the rope broke off at this point, he should still be alive. But no, he's dead. So now we somehow need to find a newer piece of rope. Luckily for us, we have a time machine. So Ike travels to the early 1900s and enters the tower during that time period. This rope should be young enough to support his weight. So we do the whole rope tying shuffle again and this time the plan somehow miraculously actually works. Ike hangs off the rope for a bit and then starts pulling himself up the rope. <coughs> And again, so many flaws with this plan. Like, the killer would obviously just look down and see Ike's stupid ass, you know, trying to climb up and then just cut the rope or untie the rope. Or even if he was, let's say that he was a fucking stupid mouth breathing moron like Ike, he wouldn't fucking, there would be no sound. Like, there would be no thud. You'd only hear just eh, 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 of Ike climbing up. But no, somehow the killer does none of those things and Ike just, you know, freely climbs up. This is so fucking stupid, dude. I fucking... It's insanity. Like, how did they think this would work? <laughs> like, it's so stupid. I hate it. I really do. Whatever. Moving on with the story. So as Ike's making his way down the tower, he notices that the previously locked door that's connecting the tower to Eckert's office in the museum slash library is now open. I expected Ike to like get a one up on Eckert here, like really, you know, surprise him that he's still alive and lay into him. But the game managed to make even this like reveal lame because Eckert's so like, Oh, it's you, come on in. Before Ike can even say anything, that's so lame. And then Eckert starts fucking interrogating Ike over the dumb fucking comb Margaret gave him because that comb apparently dropped when we fell, when he fucking pushed us off the tower. When he pushed Ike off the fucking tower. Why are they so fucking chill? Why are they so fucking cool about it? Like this man tried to kill you like fucking 0.3 seconds ago. Fuck, this shit sucks. <sighs> okay, I'm cool. I'm chill. I'm calm. I'm collected. Look how collected I am. There's only one of me. So after Eckert interrogates Ike 
he's like, oh, seeing that call made me realize you too have someone you care about. So sorry, I shouldn't have tried killing you. My bad. Tee hee. He then tells us that he got a call from someone sounding like a young man saying they have his daughter and that they'll hand her over if he kills Ike. But he only did this one specific murder in this one chapter. He had nothing to do with the other attempts. So I guess someone just stole his vase in the previous chapter and he d didn't care or anything. That's never explained by the way. The whole va like vase thing is never explained. Like we know that's the murder weapon, but we don't know who, why or when killed us with it. Eckert says he's really, really, really sorry. And Ike's all like, oh, no worries, bro. It's all cool. But Ike says that he still needs to get to the bottom of this and heads out. And then right before the chapter ends, Ike notices in the hallway of the museum slash library, an old time portrait of Dana holding the Philosopher's Stone. Oh, <gasps> a lead. And that's this chapter, dude. It fucking blows. Uh, on to the last proper chapter. See ya there, losers. No one's watching this. Everyone clicked off like in the first 30 seconds. Good on you. And here we are, the final chapter. Granted, there's still the epilogue, but it's just like one big cutscene that just explains the ending you got, basically. And just like chapter one, this chapter's cause of death is absolutely nothing. If you waste enough time, I could just straight up collapse. At least they started and ended the chapters on the same note, I guess. But I can't believe that in this story-focused game, they ran out of ways to kill the main character twice already, and that's like literally the only point of the game. Anyway, when Ike notices the portrait of Dana, the digipad starts flashing again, meaning that he's able to time travel to a new time. We then use the digipad to travel to 1584. After walking around a bit, you just stumble onto Dana. It was that fucking easy. No wonder, since this is a 10 building town, like I could have easily found Dana that first night if he gave a shit. And why is Dana like all super casual when she sees him? She literally says, oh, you're that guy from that one time. Excuse me? What the fuck kind of a reaction is that? Like, that's your reaction to A, being stranded in the 15 fucking hundreds, and just to the fact that time travel is real. Like, why is she so fucking chill? Then she goes on saying how she actually enjoys being in this time period. That it feels right to her saying that in the future she felt like she had no one. But like she was literally dropped here. Like literally she was dropped in the middle of nowhere and she actually doesn't know anyone here. Like yeah, okay, enjoy the fucking three months of life in the 1500s before you stub your fucking toe and then die out of a fucking ingro toenail. You fucking venge. The even more insane thing is that later in the conversation we get an option between basically saying okay well like have fun in the dark ages or we could ask her to come back to the present with us and only after asking her to come back does she freak out. Like why are you reacting this way only now? This fucking chick is driving me crazy dude, I can't. For this playthrough I did choose to ask her to come with us and she tells us that she needs more time to think about it. Axe is like, okay, whatever, he clearly is so checked out, he does not give a shit about Dana at all. And asks if she's willing to give him the Philosopher's Stone, you know. There we go, the fucking thing he's actually interested in. But Dana gives him the stone saying like, it was never hers to begin with, blah blah blah, now the game wants us to give the stone to the alchemist, so away we go. We make our way to the alchemist and give him the Philosopher's Stone, and then the guy says to come back in 10 days to see the results of the experiment. But we didn't remember that in 10 days time, the alchemist's house explodes. And Ike tries to warn the alchemist, but Wagner says like he's willing to take the risk, he's come too far to back down now. And Ike's like, okay, sure. I really don't know like why Ike keeps going along with all of this since he clearly doesn't care. Before heading out, Wagner asks us not to mention any of this to his children, because if Hugo found out about this, he'd try something silly, like bringing his mother back to life. Like he literally says he can't seem to face his mother's death. No shit. Like, that's still relatively recent, and this guy isn't helping because literally for all of Hugo's life, this guy's been tinkering away in his fucking evil villain lair. This guy is like the worst parent ever. Wagner then says that if the experiment is successful and he is satisfied with his quest for the truth, he'll set all of the evidence of it on fire. That is such a waste though. Like, this guy literally spent all his life in the, you know, the search of knowledge, and then as soon as he finds out, he's just like, okay, cool, I'm not gonna do anything with that. Like, that's cool, and I guess noble, if it's a hobby. But, like, it's not worth just neglecting your family over. Like, this guy's an idiot, man. I don't, I don't care how 
fucking cool and tricked out his evil lair is, he's a fucking moron through and through. As Ike comes out of the laboratory, he's immediately questioned by Hugo, because he's like hella suspicious of his father, and then he just casually says that he like sorta gets how Ike's time travel machine works. Seriously? He like literally just touched it and dropped it four years ago. Either time travel is like way simpler than we thought, or this little shit is full of it. While they're yapping away, Hugo's father pops up to announce that he's conducting the experiment and that it's too dangerous for them to hang around. So he pretty much just kicks them out of the house for 10 days, like his own children. He then refuses to elaborate and just goes back downstairs. I hate this guy. I hate everyone in this fucking game, dude. And like this scene is actually so sad, like Margaret and Hugo are trying to figure out where to even live for the next 10 days. And I then awkwardly says like, Okay, I'm gonna go now. And he literally just leaves. Like, just exits the house and leaves these poor fucking 16th century children to fend for themselves. We then do a short little time travel hop 10 days in the future so we can see the results of the experiment. Surprise, the house is on fire. Ike enters and hears Margaret's voice coming from the basement, so he heads down to investigate. He doesn't see anyone, but he comes across a very rudimentary looking time travel machine with a date set to 2001. Oh my god, Hugo's gonna do 9-11, someone stop him! So after investigating the scene, we travel back to the present, and as soon as we get back, we get a phone call from Hugo. Ike asks him how he got his number, and I feel like that's totally irrelevant at this point. Like, this 13-year-old cringe lord from the fucking 16th century managed to make a working, a functioning time machine? And you're wondering how he got your number? Like, even I could figure it out. This town has 12 people in it. Motherfucker asked around. There. Case closed. But Hugo reveals that he got Ike's number from Eckert, and that he's the one who blackmailed him to kill Ike by just telling him what he wanted to hear. So it's pretty much like confirmation that Hugo had actually nothing to do with the murder and kidnapping of Eckert's family. He then tells Ike that he technically didn't make the time machine, but that his future self made it and dropped it off for him. Hugo says that his machine can only track and follow Ike's time travel machine. Ike tries asking about Margaret, but Hugo tells him to bring the homunculus to the square, otherwise someone he cares about will die. And right before Hugo hands up, we hear Margaret's voice, so... Margaret, this fucking psycho is holding his own fucking sister hostage. Already I can smell some plot hole bullshit, but I'm gonna hold off, cause like we're gonna get way more ammo <laughs> when we meet up with Hugo. As soon as we see Hugo at the square, we recognize him as the kid that was crying in front of the burning bar, like way back in chapter 1. So this little shit's been behind this all along. Like he's also the one that fucking poisoned us. And this fucking moron thinks we convinced his father to use the Philosopher's Stone to create the homunculus. Hugo says that he originally wanted to try and kill Ike before he starts all of this shit, but that Hugo's time machine could only follow Ike's digipad. And like that's not true at all. Literally the thing that started all of this was Ike getting stabbed before he, cut, he had the time machine. So how could Hugo do this if he could only follow Ike's time machine. He then says this. I had so many chances, but I still didn't manage to kill you off. And like technically that's not true at all, because the whole point of this game is to close off those chances to kill Ike by, you know, using time travel. Because in his reality he didn't get a single chance to kill Ike, something would always prevent him. And I know this is more of like a nitpicky plot hole, but it just annoys me because that's the whole fucking point of the game. But okay, moving on, Hugo says that since he can't prevent all of this from happening, he's gonna sell for the next best thing, he's gonna make Ike bring the homunculus here so that he can kill him in order to get access to the philosophy. Philosopher's Stone. And the reason he wants the Philosopher's Stone is... You guessed it. I'm going to make mother. Ugh, he says it so creepily, dude. I hate this little shit. I fucking hate everyone in this fucking game. God! So he's doing all this to have a happy family, but he's holding his own sister hostage in order to do that. Yeah, fucking awesome plan, dude. Like, that's so stupid. I feel like also there's no way he would hurt her. Even Margaret isn't really taking him seriously. I feel like both Margaret and Ike are just playing along not to hurt his feelings. But Hugo says if Ike doesn't bring the homunculus here, he'll leave Margaret in this time because that's sure to fuck up the space-time continuum or whatever. Did he forget that Ike also has a time machine? Like, I could just wait for Hugo to go and then take Margaret back to her own timeline. Like, this, this guy's a moron. And... Let's not forget that he literally left the fucking time machine back home. This guy is stuck here. He isn't going anywhere. Anyways, Ike tells Hugh that he can't bring the homunculus here because he has no idea where he is and that they're not friends or anything like that. But Hugo doesn't want to hear it, so he gives us 20 minutes to figure it out. 20 minutes? When both of us have fucking time machines? What's the point in that? That is meaningless. 
20 minutes in a time traveling story is both an infinite and a non-existent amount of time. What a fucking moron, dude. I hate this fucking kid. How the fuck did he create a time machine in his entire lifetime? Okay, so it took me quite a bit to figure out what to do in this chapter. At first, I tried to somehow find Mario to bring him to Hugo, but that's actually not even remotely close to what I'm supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is go back to the alchemist's house after the experiment, but before Hugo and Margaret get there. You need to fully burn the alchemist's notes so that Hugo can't read them. And I even struggled with that. I thought I had to use Ike's lighter that's in his inventory, like that made sense to me. I even found like a whole shelf of notes and books and I kept trying to use my lighter on it over and over and over again but it just didn't seem to work like i spent way too much time on this part because i just straight up didn't know what i was doing wrong turns out that the fucking actual notes were just sitting on a table just out of frame and the only way the camera would like move to show it is if i got like all the way up to the notes so like unless you knew exactly where they were they were invisible to you and honestly i think that's kind of bullshit i'm calling bullshit on that one so Ike takes the notes and throws them on the open fire that's on the stove and then right as he's burning the notes, Hugo and Margaret come downstairs asking about their father. Hugo immediately starts asking about what Ike is burning and Ike tries to tell him it's nothing important in the most unconvincing way imaginable. Ike then just awkwardly excuses himself and uses the digipad to go back to the present. Like he really didn't try to convince them not to investigate further. But we make our way back to the town square which triggers a cutscene. And honestly this is a pretty cool cutscene and because it ends in a most most horrifying fucking Black Mirror-esque way, I'm just gonna let it play out. What the? Hugo's still here? Wasn't it enough just to burn the research data? He's nowhere to be found. Where could father be? Hugo? What is it? Just wondering. I mean, what could he have been burning? Didn't I tell you to bring homunculus? If you won't do what I say, I'll... Uh... Hugo! Dis... Distillation? Something? And... With... to do now, right? I think Ike's out there looking for father too. Come on. We can't let him do all the work, can we? Yeah, guess you're right. Hugo's all right. What? The past's been changed. That's why... What do you mean? What's going on? Hugo, what happened to Hugo? Answer me! It's all right. Everything's okay. What kind of an answer is that? Ah, 
What? What the? No. Oh, I get it now. By changing Hugo's past, I've canceled the existence of the time machine itself. Is it over? All this? What the fuck was that? That was actually so horrifying. Like Hugo and Margaret are clearly in so much pain and petrified. And Ike's over there just like, Hugo's alright. And then like as Margaret is vanishing, she like lets out this fucking horrifying blood curdling death rattle. And he's like, oh I get it now. Like what a fucking psychopath. Just have some compassion. So the epilogue is just one big cutscene that tries and fails to tie up any loose ends we had left in the story. Mario just appears behind Ike to congratulate him on cleaning up this whole fucking messy situation. And Ike's so like, you use me, wah, wah, this is all to save you, wah, wah. And Mario is like, uh, yeah. And then he asks Ike to give him back the digipad and Ike just gives it to him? What? Like, he's such a fucking beta cuck soy boy. Like, they clearly said multiple times in the story by this point that Mario is hella weak right now, so he could just, you know, beat the shit out of him. Like, I could just punch his block off, but he doesn't do anything. What a fucking cuck, dude. And then Mario just walks away. Huh? That was the lame part of the epilogue. And now this next part, while not perfect, is actually pretty neat. So this is the flashback of what happened during Wagner's experiment in the 1500s. So it turns out that Mario wasn't a homunculus at all. He was a djinn or like a genie trapped in the philosopher's stone and the alchemist experiment only broke the seal and freed Mario the djinn. And the alchemist is like absolutely distraught by that information. Like pretty much as soon as Mario appears he's like oh no what a colossal waste of time. Like he was so fucking fast to turn to despair. Like that's so dramatic, while it is true that his research didn't bring him like the specific exact answers he was looking for, he still made a fucking amazing discovery. And he uncovered an ancient fucking magic being. But this fucking guy just doesn't give a shit about that. He only now realizes he wasted his whole life away. And so then his one wish is for Mario to give him back his youth and he wants to stay that age forever. Mario obliges and then this happens. Am I? Did it really work? Trust me, okay? You got exactly what you wished for. Your work here is done. It's back to where you came from, demon. It's no great art to get rid of the likes of you, but I was well advised to ready an additional barrier. Return to the stone from whence you came, and I will start my research and my life from the beginning. You, you, damn it, you'll pay for this. No pentagram is completely Where am I? Uh, uh. 
beautiful stone. And that's the end of the game, folks. We were the horrible father all along. I gotta admit, I really like this twist, but it just confused the story even more. Like, how does that memory wipe spell even work, then? I'd assume that the spell made Ike only forget, you know, his alchemist life, but he still lived for 500 years after that, so why doesn't he remember that? And it's not like he's just completely, you know, forever, perpetually without memories. Because he remembers his life, you know, in the 21st century. Like, he thought that he was an orphan, so he remembers, I guess, his childhood. And he made plans with Eckert before the game. So, it just makes no sense. Also, why doesn't he remember owning the Philosopher's Stone? That's like his longest possession. That's been in his inventory for over 500 years. And then the one time that's important for him to have, he doesn't know it. He he never seen that stone in his life, but he, he remembers the lighter being his, for example. So, why not the stone? It just m doesn't make any sense. And for this part, sadly, as much as I really appreciate the Shadow of Memories wiki page, it was really helpful for me, you know, during all of this research. For this part, I kind of have to, you know, call them out, but not really. Like at certain pages and at certain points of this game, on the wiki, they are like very clearly like kind of twisting the events of the game, choosing to interpret them in a way, you know, that makes the most sense. And like, I understand wanting to do that as like a fan of the game. It's not objective <laughs> at all. I guess it is like a fandom wiki page, so you know, who, who gives a shit really. But it's just something, you know, something interesting that I noticed. So on the wiki page for this ending, they go through the final flashback cutscene and say, over the course of the next several centuries, Ike then becomes an immortal wanderer who permanently loses all his long-term memories on a regular periodic basis. And they say it so like matter-of-factly, as if that was in the cutscene. And like, no it wasn't. Like, that's not what happened. Like, did we watch the same cutscene? All we know is that he just walks out with no memory of what happened before. Like, there was, in the actual cutscene, there was nothing about, you know, the whole periodic loss of memory. Like, that explanation would make sense, but that is not what was given to us by the game. They just put it in the part of, like, you know, the cutscene explanation. I feel like they should have put that in just a separate section, like, you know, fan theory. But it was just, like, literally in the same paragraph as the actual ending, just like, this is what happened. This is the spell. And that's kinda, you know, <laughs> kinda problematic. I think we should definitely cancel that one poor super fan of this game. We gotta cancel them on Twitter and we gotta dox them, everybody. So please, hashtag Shadow of Memories uh, fan Vicky is over party. Let's get that running, everybody. No, I'm kidding, you know, with peace and love. I'm, I really, really do appreciate the wiki, but that is just like something that I had to point out. It was more funny than anything, you know, just like interesting, like, huh, okay. <laughs>
zero ad revenue because I'm too small to get ads. This ending is so lame actually, like, I think this is the worst ending you can get uh, in this game. It doesn't explain anything. I could just like, oh okay, things happened, I guess I'll go home. So it's very unrewarding and there's a ton of unanswered questions, so it's time to fucking keep digging for answers. And this time, on the new and improved PSP version. Michael, don't leave me here. Michael, Michael, help me. Hello, and welcome to the PSP port of Shadow of Memories. I actually played this version on actual hardware. Look, look. I hope this is like in shot and focused. But yeah, I had it on, I have it on my real PSP that I've had since my 10th birthday. I, I fuck, I still genuinely at some, I'm just rambling on at this point. But look, it's very cool, very fun, I like it, I love it. So I had to emulate the PS2 version even though I actually have, you know, the, a PS2, here's, <laughs> here's proof. Look, it's a PS2, I have it, okay, I'm a cool, retro, loving gamer. Okay, I'm I'm no I'm no noob, but I still emulated it on PC. But I wanted to at least experience the PSP version, the way it's meant to be played, or whatever. And uh, it was pretty fun. I just played it in bed. So the PSP version came out eight years after the original, and it's genuinely baffling to me that it even got a PSP release. Like it's such a niche game. Who was clamoring <laughs> for an for a modern version of this game? I'm I guess I'm kind of happy. That they did it, but I feel like especially Konami had like a bunch of other cooler games they could have ported. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm really really happy that this exists, because I I love it whenever any old game gets like a port or re-release, no matter how bad or shit it is, it's just... Game preservation is really, really bad <laughs> in the game industry, so you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it, but it is kind of a weird, questionable decision. But anyways... With this port, you know, came a bunch of uh, changes, fixes, upgrades, updates. And I gotta say, I'm not a fan of a lot of them. Sorry, spoiler alert, but they kinda ruined the vibe for me. Probably the most noticeable change was the completely new voiceover for the game. They even recast the homunculus slash Jin, meaning we lost Charles Martinet. That's really lame, dude. It really is kind of a bummer that they redid the voiceovers, because the new voices are like, I guess, technically more standard than the original. But like, it loses the weird Lynchian, still voice acting vibe the original had. And now it's just acceptable at the time voice acting. Thanks, but no thanks. Sounds too good to be true. Why? Why? Can't you trust me? Trust me. Of course not. I get it. You're the big S, the devil. In exchange for your immortal soul and all that, am I right? Your soul, your soul. Oh, please, in this day and age. <laughs> If I do have an agenda, it's that you survive. Well, thanks, but no thanks. Sounds too good to be true. Why? Can't you trust me? Of course not. Look, I get it. You're the evil one, the devil. In exchange for your immortal soul and all that, am I right? Your soul, your soul. Oh, please. In this day and age? <laughs> Well, if I do have an agenda, it's that you survive. They also redesigned a lot of the interface and made the game wide screen. 16 by 9. Ever, ever heard of it? Wide. One change that really bummed me out was the loss of my beloved digipad. The rest in peace digipad, gone too soon. Now it's called the Z-pad, and like that's cool too, I guess, but digipad hits so much harder though. But I'd be okay if it was only the name that was changed, but they completely changed the UI for the digipad. It's so emotionless now, like where are my weird little bottomless cubes, where's my pointless tesla coil at the top, or whatever the fuck that was. What, what is this garbage man, I want my digipad back. The one really cool idea this redesign did have, was showing a picture of how the town looked in the time period you select, but even that detail is kinda lost, because like it's all the way in the background of the menu and barely noticeable. Like I can tell the background is changing, but not really to what. This is a definite downgrade. And then one 
one last change to the game that's worth mentioning is that they redid all of the ending illustrations. And this too is a downgrade. Like just look at the D ending illustration for example. Now it's so standard, it looks like a typical visual novel and it's just so, I don't know, meh. That's the best way I can put it, it's just like whatever. I know all of this sounds like nitpicky, but I wouldn't mind any of these changes if they were the only one, except the voice acting. The voice acting just should have stayed the original. But all of these things together just makes it more eh, like a typical visual novel-y kinda game. It lost that kinda like ethereal vibe to it. It felt like such a weird Lynchian experience, but now it just feels like a low budget, badly written game, you know? And I think that's why I sped through the PSP version, because I was disillusioned by the whole thing. But it could be that I was also just disillusioned near the ending of my first playthrough, because I did, at that point I did realize like, wow, this is a bad story. <laughs> so I, I might be just, you know, bullshitting. Either way, I am, I am sad about the changes. It definitely lost the charm. You know, so now all of the issues are like 10 times more glaring. But that's enough. Let's actually get on to the C ending. That's the ending I got for the PSP version. If I could only do it all again, just one more time. So since the D ending was such shit, I just made like the opposite choices of the choices I made in that ending in hopes of getting just like a really killer ending. So those opposite choices boil down to telling Margaret that I think she's Ike's ancestor and then later in the game letting Dana stay in the 1500s without, you know, putting up a fuss or anything. And despite those kinda big differences, the game plays out pretty much the same up until the very end in chapter 8, when Hugo holds Margaret hostage. This time around Hugo's reason for holding her hostage is if he kills her that means that Ike will disappear from existence and that's why we have to do what he says. And I gotta give it to him, that's a much better reason for Ike to play along. Despite Hugo telling us to go get Mario, we yet again just go to the exploded lab after the experiment went wrong. Unlike the D ending, there's no mention of the research notes in the lab, so Ike's reason to go back to the lab is to stop future Hugo from handing over the time machine to, you know, our past Hugo, Hugo, Hugo. So Ike lies in wait and sees the time traveling Hugo appear in the middle of the lab. Old Hugo immediately starts exposition dumping and shit talking Ike to Hugo. That's when Ike decides to jump out of his hiding spot and tries to clear his name. This scares the future Hugo so much that he tries to run away upstairs but he bumps into Margaret. Future Hugo then tries to like beat Margaret with his walking stick, I guess to make her move, but that causes Hugo Hugo to jump at future Hugo to stop him, which in turn causes a time paradox, erasing both Hugos from reality instantly. Damn, dude, poor Hugo can't catch a break. Or, or fucking Margaret. Th those damn poor kids, man, they just are tortured. They're fucking tortured by time. Those medieval kids, Oof. She just collapses on the staircase in shock, cause like, what the fuck did she just witness? Ike then just leaves them and time travels back to the time square in his time period. Like, he just leaves her there and never comes back. This man is a horrible father in like, every reality. Back in the present time, Ike sees that there's no one there anymore. No shit! You saw him be fucking Thanos snapped out of reality. Just like in the D ending, Mario just appears in front of Ike, asks for the digipad back, and Ike's just like, hmm, okay, gives him the digipad, and that's it, he leaves. Like, man. Just fucking punch him or something. Once Mario disappears forever and the story is over, Ike takes a moment to look around and smell the roses or whatever, and he's all like, whoa, I never noticed how nice this town is, and oh, life is great actually. I love life. And then this fucking happens. Hey, dude, I think he's like a drunk or something. Hey, wait, aren't you like the one who smashed, dude? <laughs> right on, dude. So it's like, join the club. <laughs> Let's hit the road and rock and roll. <laughs> Catch you later, dude. Yeah, later. You're gonna, like, get run over or something if you stay there. <laughs> That's oh, right. Oh. Whoa.
excuse me jesus christ man this is actually the a worse ending than the d ending i can't believe it like i really really tried to make the choices the game wanted me to make and i still got such a big fuck you from the game this game fucking hates me or something i can't believe i got like two horrible endings back to back Oh my god, what if, like, all of the endings are just horrible fuck you endings? And so my spray experience has come to an end. Okay, now this ending ties up all of the loose ends we had up until now. It plays exactly like the C ending right up to the point when Hugo gives us 20 minutes to go get homunculus. This time though, Ike actually tries to track down Homunculus, so we time travel to the 1980s, because we maybe kinda saw him carrying a baby back when we were dealing with the whole Eckert fucking family. So if we look around for a bit, we can actually find him resting, and he reveals to us that he actually switched Margaret and Dana around when they were babies. So Margaret is actually Eckert's daughter, and that's why she always felt connected to Ike's time period, and why she could feel parental love emanating from the comb she gave Ike. That's also why Dana feels so much more comfortable in the 1500s, because she's actually from that time period. Ike then asks Mario if that means he was also the one who killed Eckert's wife, and Mario denies this, saying that he only saved the child from also getting killed. So Mario says that he switched the babies around in case Hugo tries pulling the all leaving your ancestor in the future does make you never exist trick. But Mario knows that Ike isn't a descendant of Margaret or Dana, like he's literally the only person in the world who knows Ike's true origins. So why would he do that? It's literally not helping anyone. Not even him, because he's just like super exhausted from just picking up a baby. Like he fucked the space-time continuum for no reason, for shits and giggles, I guess. Ike tries telling Mario how like absolutely fucked up and unhinged it is that he did all of this, but Mario doesn't care at all. Ike then asks Mario to come with him because Hugo wants to talk to him. Mario says no way, because he's way too fragile right now and he has to watch out for himself. Okay, so that cutscene is over and now we're done with this time period. Now we have to go back to the present and visit the fortune teller for yet another dose of exposition. So we talk to the fortune teller and it turns out that she's the spirit of Helen, Hugo's mom. She says that Hugo once tried to bring her back to life using the alchemist experiment equipment and Helen's lock of hair. But it went horribly wrong wrong and only her spirit was brought back and she's now cursed to stay here for all eternity. And she's only able to communicate with people who are near death and that's why we are able to talk to her throughout the entire game. This also explains why Hugo blew up at Margaret when she brought up Helen's lock of hair. And then after this truth bomb, Helen tells Ike that Mario isn't actually a homunculus but he is a genie who was trapped in the Philosopher's Stone and that the alchemist experiment only freed him from the stone. Finally, she says that if we ever see Hugo, to tell him that even though he did an unforgivable thing, she still forgives him. Aw, what a nice mom. But spoiler alert, Ike's ass is not saying that to Hugo. So after saying all of that exposition crap, the fortune teller lady finally disappears and leaves behind a disheveled empty house. So Ike goes outside and is met by Mario of all people. Mario asks what he was doing there and that even he can't see anything. Ike suddenly gets an idea and suggests to Mario that he should bring up Wagner's spirit to talk to Hugo if he can. Mario says like, okay, sure, and summons Wagner, but something seems off about him, but Ike doesn't realize that at all. Ike then explains the situation to Wagner, and then they go to the town square to meet up with Hugo and Margaret. Wagner ends up reprimanding Hugo and promising to explain everything about the experiment if Hugo stops at the whole trying to kill Ike thing. Hugo and Wagner hug, which you know is probably the first time they ever did that, and that causes both of them to disappear in a cloud of smoke. Mario then appears before Ike and Margaret, and explains that he just tricked Hugo by creating a Wagner puppet. Ike then asks where he took them and Mario is like, meh, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Like you fucking created the spell. It could be so easy for him to say like, oh, you know, I just took, took them to their time. But he just says, eh, I don't know. I don't care. Someone needs to fucking put a stop to this guy. He's, this Mario fella is a menace. Mario explains that the reason why he didn't summon the actual Wagner spirit is because he's still alive. So that means that even in this ending, Ike and Wagner are the same person, so the flashback scene did occur. So why the fuck did Mario switch the damn babies around? Like, he definitively knows. Neither Margaret or Dana are Ike's ancestors. So what the fuck is his problem? Another weird thing about this ending is that both Ike and Margaret are like completely unbothered. 
when Mario says that Wagner is still alive. Like, excuse me, wouldn't you be like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> but and that's also like double fucked up for Margaret because she doesn't care that her dad is still alive and she doesn't care that Hugo is just vanished into thin air. She's like, huh? Huh? Just doesn't, absolutely doesn't give a shit. She is, though, admittedly, she is super down bad for the future. Mario then tells Ike that he should probably take Margaret back to her time, and that's when Ike can decide whether to take her back or leave her in this time period. That's kind of fucked up, though, because Margaret explicitly says that she wants to stay here. And she is also actually Eckert's daughter, so she does belong in this time period. But if we wanted to, we can just say, nah, you're going back to the Dark Ages. But in order to get the A ending, we actually, you know, agree with Margaret and let her stay here. And then after the whole Margaret situation is settled, Ike starts giving Mario the digipad back, and then this happens. Yes, hand it over. Oh! And holy shit, that's a fucking crazy death scene. First of all, I love the melting animation for Mario. It's so fucking horrifying and cool at the same time. Second of all though, that's so funny. Like the digipad fell two feet and it exploded. And this is like the third time it fucking fell to the ground. Why didn't this happen when Mario threw the digipad to the ground from like way higher up at the beginning? Or when fucking Hugo pickpocketed Ike. But I love how absolutely weak Mario is. Like literally Ike at any point could just fucking sucker punch the fucker and he'd explode and melt into bits. Wait a minute, why didn't Mario see the fortune teller like why wasn't he able to see her because he died like 10 minutes after the fortune teller so he was also at you know at at his deathbed or whatever like he was near death so he should have seen her so yet again yes we have found yet another plot hole i i'm not counting these there's way too many okay some time has passed and in the final cutscene we see ike meeting up with margaret and damn dude she's really fitting into this time period She's so like early 2000s core, I love it. But the two of them meet up and Ike's little exposition dump inner monologue reveals that Eckert end up adopting Margaret, and that's really cool. But kind of fucked up that Ike never bothered to tell at least Margaret that Eckert is her actual father, and that she was born in the 1980s. Like, I understand not telling Eckert, because he doesn't know about the whole time travel shit, but Margaret experienced all of this. And she's definitely, you know, seen crazier shit like I'd want to know. But no, Ike just keeps that little piece of fucking wisdom to himself for some reason. But anyways, they notice a big ass tree and say, this wasn't here before. Ike then fucking just pulls out the Philosopher's Stone from the tree. And the end. That was weird. I guess Genie Blood is like really good fertilizer or something. Hold on, isn't this like kinda fucked up? Like Ike is her father, isn't he? Like it, it's true, he's not her biological father and he doesn't remember being her father but kinda he is her dad so it's just kind of like borderline creepy because they're clearly on a date it's all over, but somehow it left me without a sense of fidelity Okay, so the B ending is closely tied to the A ending, and it actually has three different variants, but all of them end in the exact same way, but just the path to get to that ending is wildly different. The B1 ending shows what would happen if Ike went to the fortune teller only after Hugo travels to the present. So Ike talks to the fortune teller and she gives him the whole exposition dump thing again, and then Ike goes back to the town square and tells Hugo that his mother's spirit is still at their house. Hugo doesn't believe him, but he goes to check anyways, and he starts hearing Helen's voice, so he enters the abandoned house. And that's when Helen starts reprimanding Hugo for what he did as the house starts falling apart. So I guess all the talk about Helen forgiving Hugo was complete and utter BS. Like she very clearly killed Hugo for what he did to her. The house then collapses killing Hugo. Outside the building, Margaret is freaking out but Ike isn't letting her go inside because it's too dangerous and then Mario appears saying GG or whatever. Margaret says that even though she's completely alone, now she wants to go back to the 1500s. 
And oh my god, dude, this poor girl just can't catch a break. Like, I feel like so far in every single ending, Margaret is just catching strays for no reason. So Mario calibrates the digipad for one last trip to the 1500s and lets Ike take Margaret back. Ike and Margaret have a really lackluster goodbye, Ike gives the digipad to Mario like a cuck yet again, and then Ike decides to get sloshed at the bar. At which bar, by the way, Ike died twice so far. Like me, personally, I won't risk a third time, but you know, that's just me. And that's the B1 ending. Oh, by the way, every B ending will end with Ike saying, I guess I'll go take a drink to celebrate. Okay, on to B2 ending. So this time around, instead of going to the fortune teller, Ike goes to the homunculus in the 1980s. So now Ike knows that Margaret isn't his ancestor. He then goes back to the square and basically starts messing with Hugo, cause now he knows that there's nothing Hugo can do to him. While Ike is big dogging Hugo, all of a sudden Eckert appears behind Hugo and fucking bear hugs his ass. And this is so crazy because Eckert is clearly struggling and Ike doesn't even think to help him or anything. He's just asking, are you alright? And how did you get here? From like 10 feet away. And also Hugo has a fucking knife in his hand and doesn't even think to use it. But somehow manages to suplex Eckert who's like twice the size of him. Absolutely insane. To be fair, Hugo does have that chair kicking dog in him, but Ecker then tackles him and finally stops him. He gives Hugo like a really basic speech about how killing is wrong and that's apparently enough for Hugo to absolutely fully give up on his plans and like become a completely different person. Jesus Christ, Wagner really didn't spend a single second with his kids, did he? Like the moment a proper father figure appears, this kid is like completely reborn. Hugo apologizes and tells Margaret that he's going to take them home and destroy the time machine as a way of turning over a new leaf. Hugo says that he parked the time machine outside the town, but like, no he didn't. We fucking saw it at the lab back in the 1500s. They ain't tricking me, dude. I know what I saw. After Hugo and Margaret leave, Eckert says that Margaret reminds him of her daughter, and that's when Ike gets a fucking flashback of Mario telling him that he switched the babies. What the fuck is wrong with this man? Like, that literally happened like five minutes ago. Literally. I counted, and he completely forgets, and he doesn't bother to tell anyone. Like, after he remembers, like, oh yeah, that happened, he just goes like, huh, and that's it, like, he doesn't tell Eckert, or Margaret. This guy's a psycho, man. Eckert then just goes home, and then the same scene of Ike cockishly giving Mario the digipad and going drinking occurs. Now, for the B3 ending, this one is like basically the A ending up until the part where Margaret has to decide whether to stay or leave. Or you know, where Hugo has to make the decision for Margaret. If you choose, don't do it, it's better for you to go home. Ike doesn't even say anything. Like Margaret just rewrites herself to say exactly the same thing as what she said during the B1 ending. Like literally, she says this back to back. Then I won't go back. It's too lonely by myself. And besides, I feel good here, like I belong. It's a strange thing to feel, but I think I should go with it. I... I want to go home, even if it means I'll be alone. Really? Like, they clearly just put in the rest of the B ending in the middle of the A ending. I really don't know why they even bothered to give this option to Ike during the A ending. Because, like, it's so jarring. She literally states, like, two completely contradicting statements back to back. But yeah, you take her home, give back the digipad, and go drinking. The end. So this ending is all about convincing Dana to go back to the present with Ike. After talking with Dana back in chapter 8 and telling her that she should go back to her time period, Ike goes back to 2001 to the cafe where Dana used to work. We find a heartfelt note for Dana written by her boss and take that note back to Dana. After reading the note, she realizes that she isn't alone as she thought and decides that she actually wants to go back to the present. Oh, and Hugo the fucking little creep saw all of that. That little shit is a fucking master spy. We then take her to 2001 and set her on her merry way. Alone. At 3 a.m. after 4 years of not living in this time period. Yeah, nothing's gonna happen to her. She's gonna be fine. Fine. Fine, fine, fine. After all that Dana business, the story goes back to the normal Philosopher's Stone bullshit. 
and remains the same as every other ending until we visit Wagner 10 days later to see if the experiment worked. We go to the basement, but this time Margaret is here with the time machine that Hugo used. Ike tells Margaret that he'll take care of this and then goes back to 2001. At the Times Square yet again Hugo waits for us, but this time he's holding Dana hostage instead of the usual Margaret hostage. He threatens to kill her if we don't bring the homunculus to him, so Ike goes back to the 1500s to basically tell on Hugo to Margaret. Margaret and Ike go back to 2001 so she could talk some sense into Hugo. Talking doesn't work so she slaps him around until he becomes apologetic and then they go back to their time together like in the B ending. After Hugo and Margaret leave, Mario appears before Ike and Dana asking for the digipad back. Ike asks what happened to Wagner and then an alternate flashback scene plays out. This cutscene is pretty similar to the other flashback cutscene up until the moment where Wagner makes a wish. In this flashback Wagner wishes for Mario to be gone from his sight and Mario interprets that as killing Wagner and I guess yeah technically that would fulfill that wish. Mario then calls him an amateur and bails. So only for this ending they went out of their way to say that Ike isn't Wagner. Can you guess why? Yup, it's a Dana and Ike could hook up. But even then it's like weird and borderline and not really clear. Because after Mario tells them that story he bails again and then Dana and Ike start like teasing each other and Dana keeps saying how Ike seems like a dad and she keeps calling him dad and shit. Why the fuck did you go out of your way to remove the incest allegations to then just circle back to making it creepy again? This fucking game man. Even the fucking wiki had a whole incest section for this ending. This has caused many fans to speculate that, given their continued flirtatious rapport with each other due to genetic sexual attraction, could possibly lead to future accidental incest on their part as they are actually secretly long lost father and daughter. Further fueled by the ending screen featuring Dana's picture and containing an admission from Ike that he does not know what his future may hold, which may be for the best. Absolutely ridiculous, man. Finally, the ultimate super ending. This ending actually has two variants and the first variant being probably like the absolute best possible ending you can get in this game. So in general the way the X ending works is that Ike is somehow reliving the events of the game and for some reason he retains all the memories of you know what happened. The game seemingly starts as usual but Ike keeps making comments how he died again and how he knows that Mario is a homunculus as soon as he first hears him. And honestly this sounds way cooler than it actually is in game. Because most of the characters just ignore his knowledge of everything. Like literally at the very beginning he name drops homunculus and Mara is like oh cool you know who I am. Anyways. And like what do you mean? I would be freaking out. Because if Ike knew who he was he would never play along with his whole time travel charade. But he just basically goes like oh okay cool you know me. Awesome. What? Ike wakes up at the cafe like the usual beginning of the game, but this time he tries looking around for the philosopher's stone as soon as he wakes up, but it's not there for some reason. So since the stone isn't here for whatever reason, Ike goes out and visits the fortune teller. He tries to ask her for advice on what he should do with the stone once he gets it, but she doesn't even want to talk about it in case Mario is listening. Ike then says he's gonna decide on his own what to do and goes outside to search around town. And great, it's the fucking juggling Ike again, I fucking hate that guy. And great, he throws Ike the ball with the note again, I swear they did this just to piss me off. But this time the note is about how the Philosopher's Stone can be used as an ingredient for the elixir of life. With that information for some reason we now have to go back to the cafe to talk to Dana to get the stone back. Now she fucking has it, what? Like she was watching Ike literally look around the cafe searching for the stone and it, it wasn't there. Like did she just steal it? <laughs> from him like that's the only explanation I can think of. She fucking stole the thing. Anyways, Dana gives him the lighter and the stone back and now with the stone in our possession we can travel back in time to the 1500s. 
Oh yeah, the way to trigger the digipad to time travel is really weird. You have to talk to Hugo in front of the burning bar and then decide to go inside the bar. Once we're in the bar, the digipad will glow allowing us to travel back in time. That is kind of a weird roundabout way to do it, but oh well. Also, just one more thing, when talking to Hugo I was really disappointed that Ike didn't just call him out on his bullshit right then and there. Like he almost calls him Hugo but stops himself. And I wish he didn't. I feel like that would be a very fun and satisfying little cutscene. But what do I know? I'm just a gross little YouTube goblin. Anyways, we're finally in the 1500s and the first cutscene plays like normal. You know, you scare off everyone with the lighter or your cell phone and Margaret takes you to her home. You go upstairs and talk to Helena and Hugo like the original cutscene. But this time around, when Margaret goes to check on her dad, you tag along with her. You then give the stone to Wagner. Well, technically, you give the stone to Margaret to give to Wagner. And I think that's a real nice touch because Ike is aware that he is Wagner, so he doesn't want to risk touching himself, you know, to implode. But yeah, you tell him that's the Philosopher's Stone and that it can be used for the Elixir of Life to save Helen's life. And as Ike leaves, we can see Helen taking the Elixir of Life and already she's getting better. At the same time, Ike is starting to vanish outside and is saying how he won, how he beat fate until he finally fully disappears. And then the final cutscene plays. Wow, what a beautiful ending. Or is it? Think about it. If Ike prevented the homunculus from being created, then that means Mario would never be able to switch Margaret and Dana. So then why is Margaret still in this cutscene? She should be vanishing or at least be replaced by Dana, like just model swapped by Dana in this scene. But that doesn't happen. You could argue that Wagner just kept researching, kept working on his experiment in the lab, which I definitely believe, because the motherfucker isn't even with his family when Helen is drinking the elixir of life. He's, he's still in his fucking lab toiling away. But then, why is Ike vanishing? Because in that, in that case, Wagner would keep on with his experiment and then he would bring back Michaelis, who would then create Ike. So it doesn't make any sense. And also, how the fuck did the juggler Ike give the message to Ike? Because Ike is now disappearing. So he wasn't able to, you know, later in the future send himself the message. It's bull. It's fucked, man. It's absolutely fucked. So I don't think this is a great ending, but that doesn't matter because Snazzy Girl and Aerial Shade 1209 really like this ending. Oh, who's Snazzy Girl and Aerial Shade 1209, you ask? They're just the only commenters of this playthrough's video in on YouTube and they had a lovely little back and forth in the comments. <laughs>
I love how they also pointed out some plot holes, but just presumed like, oh, I don't understand the story fully. Like, they're giving the devs way too much credit here. Like, you're right, that doesn't make sense. It's not you, it's them. Okay, now on to the second variant. So this plays exactly the same as the first X ending, except at the very end when you get the stone and they're in the bar, instead of time traveling back to 1500s, you just let yourself die so you could pay Mario a little house visit. So once Ike dies, he wakes up in the weird little liminal space area. What is this place anyway? Mario's home? Like this is never explained, I guess he lives here? Sad. Sad. That's a sad place to live. Ike calls out to Mario saying he wants to show him something, and the moment Mario appears before him, Ike fucking chucks the Philosopher's Stone straight at Mario, causing him to die from a time paradox. Get it? Because Mario is inside the stone, trapped, so throwing it at Mario causes past and present Mario to collide. That is pretty clever, I gotta give them that. Ike again celebrates while vanishing and then the final cutscene plays same as before. Wow, what a beautiful ending. But is it though? Is it? At least now we know that Wagner isn't getting his grubby little paws on the Philosopher's Stone. And I guess you could say Margaret and Dana definitively weren't switched just because we, we weren't shown, you know, a clear contradiction like in the other X ending. But Helen still fucking dies. And Wagner is still gonna be, you know, absorbed in his research, but this time around he's gonna he's not gonna have anything to show for it. So that's still fucked. Like all of the medieval family's lives are just fucked. And poor Eckert's life is still fucked because we won't be able to prevent the murder. So now the murderer is gonna kill his wife and his child. Because remember how Mario says in the 80s that he just took the baby because the killer was going to kill the baby as well, anyways. So now they're just gone. Awesome. Man, even the truest of the true endings are so fucked up. Like genuinely every single one of these endings left a bad taste in my mouth. Oh yeah, so these X endings 100% confirm that Ike is undeniably Wagner. So then that means that the E ending is a confirmed incest ending. Wow, great. What a great game. Like the whole Wagner Ike retcon thing they did in the E ending is completely null and void because of this. I don't understand why the dev insisted on like checkmating themselves into incest. These guys are fucking messed up. I can't believe I'm finally saying this, but that's it. That's the game. Originally, I wanted to talk about all the side quests this game has, but it's nothing worth mentioning, honestly. They're all like the Sybil and the Kitten part, where you just talk to an NPC you're never gonna see again. Like the most impactful side quest I can think of is the, you know, preventing the killer from killing Eckert's wife thing, but even then you just like, in one of the endings, you see a shot of Eckert and his wife instead of just Eckert. So it's completely like, whatever. So I just didn't bother. Getting all of the endings was enough for me. I also originally wanted to talk about Time Hollow. It's a visual novel for the DS that's basically the sequel to this game. It's published by Konami and made by the same like devs who made this game. And it's about a guy using time travel to prevent his own death. like sound familiar but obviously i didn't decide to cover it in this video but who knows i may just i may down the line just make a separate video on that game it still sounds very interesting finally i just want to say thank you and i'm sorry <laughs> to the shadow of memories wiki community it really wasn't my intention to just go this hard on this game but i couldn't resist like i thought this is gonna be a great hidden gem game but it just, it real, sadly it isn't. And it, made, it makes me feel so bad because the only people who are talking about this game to this day are all the like, the super fans. And they, and they pretty much, you know, used all of their like, info, knowledge and guides to just make this video. So, and I feel bad, but like, come on, it's not, it's not a perfect game. 
We, I think we can all say that it's not a perfect game. And I feel like I'm going insane. Like, look at the reception section of the Wikipedia article for Shadow of Memories. Good adventure games on consoles are rare, and even if you normally don't like adventure games, this one is worth checking out. It lures players in like few others in recent memory. Huh? Were we playing the same fucking game? IGN's David Zderko, I'm so sorry if I butchered your name, called the story one of the deepest and most engaging that has ever been told through a video game. Excuse me? What the fuck? Johnny Minkley of Computer and Video Games Magazine called it a brilliantly conceived, wonderfully executed game. Like, it just keeps going, dude. In 2011, Adventure Gamers named it the 68th best adventure game ever released. I genuinely can't believe we were playing the same game. Like, that's of all time. That's insane, dude. I feel like the kid in Orient Express when he can't hear the sleigh bells when everyone else can. Am I the problem? Am I missing the sense of wonder to truly enjoy this game? I do understand, like, the love for it, because still, the PS2 version does have that, like, something. Something so, like, weird and, like, appealing to it. But when you actually, you know, think about the story, which is, as I said many times before, the story is the game. It doesn't make any sense. And then, for me, it just all falls apart from there. So, once again, I'm sorry. Well... I guess that's it then. I'm gonna go get a drink to celebrate surviving this video. Is it really over? Have I actually accomplished anything? Will anyone actually like, comment and subscribe after this video? Will people decide to check me out on twitch.tv slash strange underscore loop with the E at the end after this? I guess time will only tell.